Hello and good morning. Um, my name is Case Cook. I'll be talking today about uh, the work we're doing in Linux kernel for uh, adding some more meaningful bounds checking. In uh, 2021, I started looking at uh, what data we had on security vulnerabilities that were classified as buffer overflows. Um, and I went back through three years worth of these and, and found uh, 25 of them and broke them down sort of by what types they were. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, the, the four smaller ones. Um, they're handled in various other ways, but um, uh, the second largest is the array index overflow case. Um, and I think it's worth covering that first because it's quite common um, and uh, the mitigation for it already exists. So array index overflow, seven out of those 25. Um, Without any instrumentation, uh, there's there's no there's no checking of array indexes. Um, the compiler will happily just convert it into a pointer and try to read or write. Um, in this example, I've got a structure with a member um, s alg name is 64 bytes, and in you know some usage of it, you have some variable index, uh, and it's it's just going to get dereferenced and nothing is checking it. Uh, so this might be less than zero and it'll read stuff before the structure member, uh, or it's greater than 64 and it starts reading and writing uh, past the end of it. Um, this is this is the common pattern for that type of flaw. Um, so the good news is that all fixed size array indexing flaws are already mitigated today um, using the undefined behavior sanitizer uh, in GCC and Clang. So you just have to set up your, uh, your kernel configs to use these. And uh, any of these cases will be caught at runtime. Um, uh, so it's, it's really quite powerful and basically mitigates all that entire class. Uh, so that's not an issue. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, later, though. The, the example I used here is from AFALG. Um, the, the bug actually was fixed by replacing a fixed size array with a flexible array, so one that can't be determined at compile time, uh, which, you know, the fix is correct and it does all of its own uh, size checking itself. Uh, but this means things like, uh, you know, undefined behavior sanitizer can't actually see it anymore because it doesn't know how large that that array is anymore. So it, it will ignore accesses for uh, against flexible arrays. Um, and like I said, we'll come back to that. So. That leaves us these 11 memcopy buffer overflow flaws. Um, basically a destination, we're writing past the end of a destination. And it's actually the case that um, made me go look at the data, look at what the historical weaknesses were with the kernel, uh, was the bleeding tooth flaw. So this was a zero click remote code execution in Linux Bluetooth. Um, and it's, the, you know, the classic problem. We've got this last advertised data with a fixed size, uh, but the length that we're copying into it uh, was, you know, attacker controlled. And there is no, there's no checking for this and it happily writes right past the end of that array. Um, and going through the other, the remaining 10 of that same class, it's basically always the same thing. Um, here's writing past the end of an internal structure, um, more internal structures, more arrays, um, a, an array of structures, um, start getting into uh, seeing there's a pattern here with a lot of networking, um, especially wireless, and we get into you know, further things that are start being, you know, SSIDs. Um, this has been a longstanding problem. Um, and it's really kind of frustrating because, you know, the compiler has all the information it needs. It, it knows how big these destination buffers are. Uh, so it, it should be possible to check them at runtime. And in fact, some of you might be thinking, hey, wait, I thought Config Fortify Source solve this. Don't we do bounds checking on, on uh, these kinds of mem copies? And the answer is yes, we do bounds checking, but the mem copy uh, this is an ex this is sort of a simplified uh, source code dump of the fortified mem copy. But um, the the simple answer is that the main workhorse of 
the Fortify routines, uh, both in the kernel and in user space, is uh, the compiler's built-in object size uh, built-in, which analyzes the you know the pointer that you give it and gives you a size back and says, hey, this is how many bytes you've got uh, that you can write safely. Um, so uh, fortified memcopy will look at the, the, the length of the copy and if that was compile time constant, then it can at compile time fail and say, oh, our destination is size is less than our constant size that we're trying to write or read. <clears throat> so fail at compile time. And if it can't know the size of compile time, then it can do a runtime check against uh, the destination and source sizes and, and panic at runtime. Um, and if everything else checks out, we call the underlying mem copy and the actual copy occurs. So again, the main, the key point here is the built-in object size. Um, and the, the most important difference here, the reason the, the prior security flaws are, are happening, is because of this mode setting uh, for built-in object size. Mode zero says to the compiler, tell me how much, how many bytes I have from this pointer to the end of the entire structure in mode zero. And in mode one, it says, tell me how many bytes I have until the end of this structure member. So in this contrived example, uh, you've got this structure, the, the entire structure, an instance of this entire structure is 16 bytes total. Um, it's got an integer that's four bytes long. So you say, if you ask built an object size in mode zero, it's gonna say, oh, you're gonna write to count? Well, to stay inside the entire structure, you've got 16 bytes worth before you run off the end of the structure. But if you say mode one, it'll tell you, oh, you've got actually only four bytes here. That member is only four bytes. And this works for array members. Oh, this is gonna be 12 bytes to the end of the structure or just the size of the array, we've got eight bytes before you run off the end of that particular member. Uh, and the, in the case of a flexible array, uh, this place where it's uh, unsized like this, um, the compiler doesn't know. It'll return minus one, uh, which is actually size max, built in object size returns a size T variable. But effectively this is saying minus one, I don't know. It's, I, I have no way to check at compile time how big uh, the contents of this are because it's going to get allocated at runtime and I don't know where that allocation happens, et cetera, et cetera. So it can't be, flexible arrays can't be validated at compile time. Um, to diving into bleeding tooth a little bit more, you can see exactly the problem here because um, what was being targeted was this last advertising data, which was an array, HCI max 80 length. Um, but you would, you could, as an attacker, you could overflow that and keep writing until you hit this uh, list pointer uh, that was still inside the enclosing structure. So composite structures are considered the enclosing structure, and you know even outside of you know the internal discovery state struct, there was a list head struct, and you could still write to it because in mode zero for a built-in object size, it's looking at the entire size of struct HCI dev, and that's. Uh, tightening that is what's needed. So again, we've got our mode zero, limits copies to the end of the surrounding structure because of their zero arguments. And if we instead change this to a strict fortified mem copy with mode one, then we'll limit those copies to the end of the, sounding, of the surrounding structure member, which would stop all of those. <clears throat> um, and I wanted to see what effect this would have. Like, are we going to end up with false positives? What are we going to have? What, what's the data look like? Uh, so I instrumented uh, a build of all mod config and uh, it had about 35,000 memcopy calls. Um, you know, 22,000 of them, the destination buffer size isn't known at all. So it's treating it like a flexible array. It says, I give up. The built-in object size says minus zero. I don't know how I can bounds check this at all. Um, and then about 12,000 of them, the destination buffer size and the copy size are known at compile time. So they're already, you can already, you know, determine them 100% uh, with 100% accuracy at compile time. So that's nice. And there's about 1,200 where the destination buffer size is known, but the copy size is dynamic, which is exactly all of those examples I just showed. 
and looking through the 11 memcopy flaws, they all would get mitigated by adding a dynamic co uh, copy size check to, to just those cases. And that was really exciting to discover because, you know, you end up with a situation where you are risking adding a false positive runtime check to only 4% of all memcopy calls, but you're gaining potentially two orders of magnitude of additional runtime coverage uh, of unknown flaws. You know, the example being here, we had, we knew about 11 flaws of this type and that, that class of problem, there's potentially 1200 unknown other flaws. Um, so that, that, that's, a, that's a big win to have that two orders of magnitude coverage with a very, very small percentage of potential false positives to, to have to fix up and find at runtime. Um, so of course, even that would be too easy. Uh, that middle case, the 12,000 cases of a known buffer and copy size actually need to get fixed first because of intentional, like pre-existing intentional overflows, um, which will warn at compile time and then always trigger at runtime. The small good news is that they are detectable at compile time, so they can all be fixed. Uh, there were about mm, two or 300 of these to go through and, and deal with, um, and they mostly followed some common patterns. So I'll give you an example of these kind of intentional cross-member memcopy overflows um, where we know the sizes uh, ahead of time. All right, so in this memcopy, the destination that we're looking at, the, the member uh, that's being pointed at is this key material. So, you know, built-in object size inside of the fortified memcopy is going to say, oh, your max anchor key len long. And then it's going to look at key m len, which has a compile time known size of, uh, you know, max anchor key len plus two times mic key len. So it's actually saying, I want to copy into across all three of these members, uh, which also implicitly implies that they come in a specific order. Um, but this is all determined at compile time. I can see how big this is and will fail and say, hey, what are you doing? You're going to always be exceeding the end of key material. What's going on? Um, so to avoid breaking this up and having three separate mem, mem copies, um, which is a huge pain and a lot of churn, one option is you just wrap all three of them in a new structure uh, um, with a name, and then you can your mem copy can actually uh, target that that uh, that structure. And you say, oh, hey, cool. Um, the size of TKIP is in fact totally correct. Key, key mlen now matches that size, so the mem copy can continue and the compiler and Fortify are happy. Off we go. Unfortunately, if you end up changing the struct in this way, then everywhere that you refer to those members, key material, TKIP, uh, transmit and receive MIC keys, you now have to convert everything from uh, you know, from the old style to now the new name, which creates a huge amount of churn and, and, you know, might change line lengths and all sorts of other stuff and is incredibly ugly usually and incredibly disruptive to the code base. And we've got, you know, like I said, two or 300 of these to fix. It's not going to fly. Um, so uh, we ended up inventing a helper called struct group. Um, which gives us the option of referring to a collection of struct members by a group name uh, or without the group name. So um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a trick that basically says, I'm going to create a union of anonymous struct, in which case we don't need to use the name, and a named struct, and they have identical members. So we can actually refer to either all of the members collectively by the new name, or we can leave uh, we can leave the members being identified without their name, so all the existing code doesn't have to change. <clears throat> and there's additional helpers uh, for adding uh, attributes and, and tags and some other stuff, uh, but I left that out just to not fill the page. Okay, so now obviously we've fixed the however many. Um, intentional overflows, 
uh, we've got our built-in object size set to mode one. Um, all, all the compile time stuff passes now. Uh, we're left with now the runtime stuff that's been added. And if that doesn't panic, uh, we're, we're good. But of course, no, we're not done. We have to look at that list again of all the memcopy calls. We also had those 22,000 uh, cases where the destination buffer size isn't known at compile time, where built-in object size inside memcopy says mm, minus one. I don't know what this is. I, I can't know it for whatever reason. And, um, my, and I hinted at that earlier on when I was talking about um, the, the, uh, the first vulnerability that changed its array indexing from, uh, from a fixed size array to a flexible array. That's sort of the situation this is, uh, except of course, that was just for the UBSAN. So what are we gonna do about this? Um, and once again, another reminder, we've got our built-in object size here for the flexible array case is returning size max, uh, because again, it's, it's a size T return, minus one is actually size max, so the largest value that um, size T can hold. So dust size and source size are their our size max. So in this case, the compile time stuff is never going to fail, and the, the runtime stuff for destination and source checking is also never going to fail. So we're always going to be calling the underlying mem copy. That's, that's why the minus one case just falls through. So a little bit of background on uh, flexible arrays to show you a little bit more clearly um, what we've got as an example here. So the traditional flexible array structure is a structure that has a flexible array of some kind and a count of how many elements are in that array when, when it got allocated or whatever. Um, it's important to remember that while many of uh, many flexible array uses in the kernel are bytes uh, are byte arrays, um, they can be arrays of anything. They can be a structure. They could be in this case like a U32. So you know these are four byte elements. Um, and then you've got some counter to to look at it. Um, and the way that the internals work in the compiler is if you use built-in object size mode one on pixel data, like I showed, you'll get minus one. And uh, this actually will, if you try to do a size of against it, uh, the, the build will actually fail. Like size of will refuse to do anything with this and will actually fail to compile, um, which is kind of frustrating uh, while trying to deal with this. But let's move on with some other examples. Um, now this is, this is true flexible arrays. This is the, the proper C, real C way to specify this is to have that empty square brace uh, for pixel data. Now, before that was an official C standard, there was a new extension that said, "Hey, you can have a zero size, you know, a zero element array, so it takes up no space in your structure, and it'll just be trailing your structure, just like a real flexible array, except it says zero. Now, this was a new extension because actually having a zero element array wasn't at the time, I think, legal C. Um, but notice there's a difference here. Size of now actually works." against this, uh, because size of looks at that and says, oh, it's zero bytes, cool, we're done. So uh, that's a weird glitch between the two because this is still treated as a flexible array by built-in object size. It says, ah, minus one. But size of says, ah, I do know how big it is, it's zero. And before the GNU extension, the really kind of awful uh, way that this got done was you just have a one element array. So it's uh, it would take up space in your structure, but you'd keep, you'd allocate more after it. Um, and this is just really painful because uh, all of your size calculations are kind of off by one because you're saying, oh, I want the size of bitmap image uh, plus this many U32s minus one, because we already had one in our structure. Anyway, these, these uh, continue to be a huge pain to clean up in the kernel. And again, you end up with weird states where built-in object size, again, is happily pretending that it's actually a flexible array to deal with this kind of older code, so it says minus one. Um, but if you say size of pixel data, now you've got one instance of your of whatever element it is, uh, whereas before you had zero of them, so it'd be zero, and now you actually have a real size associated with it. And we go even further, and unfortunately, it's so much worse than this. Uh, both Clang and GCC treat 
any trailing array as if it were a flexible array. So if you are unlucky enough to have some fixed size uh, array at the end of your structure, uh, Fortify Source doesn't protect you in any mode. Uh, it, all writes will just succeed unbounded. Um, and that's really, really frustrating because most code has no use of doing these huge, you know, huge kinds of trailing arrays. The code like that is incredibly, incredibly rare, but there were instances, I think like sock address or something used to have, or, or still does have a 14 byte um, trailing array that actually could be up to 256, but it got changed along the way. It was, it's really, really painful. Um, luckily, we're adding now to Clang and GCC um, dash F strict flex arrays, which will clean up all of this. It'll just, it'll, it won't treat trailing arrays uh, with any size, 0, 1, 64, whatever, as flexible arrays. They will be actually sized uh, however they're specified. So only real flexible arrays will get the uh, minus one return from built-in object size. <clears throat> so, the question remains, how do we solve the dynamically sized destination uh, overflows? The compiler doesn't know the destination size uh, automatically, um, so everything has to be open, open coded. Um, but what's important to realize is that almost always the bounds are being stored somewhere, and most often they are part of the flexible array structure itself. Um, it's usually nearby. And in my uh, example here, there's you've got pixel data, your flexible array, and then you've got pixels, the count of how many of those uh, pixel data elements you've got. Um, it would be nice if we could actually get this, uh, this uh, relationship between the element count and the element array uh, actually specified in the language. <clears throat> and there have been proposals uh, like this to say you can make a flexible array, a bounded flexible array that says, ah, I'm, I am bounded by the size of you know, this member name within the same structure. And now the compiler could actually reason about the size of pixel data at runtime, uh, depending on what other things got turned on. Uh, for example, UBSAN bounds checking for, for uh, array indexing overflow could use this now for uh, flexible arrays. Uh, it would be very, very handy. Other languages have this, and it's not too hard uh, to imagine adding this to C. Uh, it would be very welcome, and I'm hoping we can get there. But without that, um, we need some way to deal with this, uh, to systematically enforce bounds checking. Um, we, we need a new API. We need to disallow memcopy with destinations that aren't a constant size, um, because C was not designed to deal with having memcopy fail. Uh, there's, there's no error checking about it. You don't, and most users even, uh, in, in switching to a new, AP, new API, will need some level of refactoring to actually uh, take an error condition and pass it up, um, because there's so many different ways uh, things can fail in, in, in this kind of code. Like just in this contrived example, <clears throat> you know, we've got count, with times height. Is this a multiplication overflow? Who knows? Here's the allocation of something, at least it's using struct size to do its calculation, um, but maybe this calculation is saturated and went to size max uh, because you know the size of pixels times count was huge. So maybe your image uh, result here was null um, it, because it failed to allocate it. Uh, how about you've calculated your count, but now it's gonna get truncated because the, the member uh, type for for holding this count can't contain the size. Uh, you know, this is a U16, but it's being assigned from a size T count. Are we gonna get truncated? And then finally, like the mem copy has no idea. You've given it some target pixel data. Who knows what's happened? How big it is? After all, those other flaws weren't checked. And maybe again, you've got count times your U32 size. You get an out of bound right, etc. Like there's just a whole series of different things um, that in in safe code or accidentally safe code are are doing these checks and they're all open coded. They're, they have to remember to do each one of these and check everything. And usually the, the you know the null check is definitely one that gets caught, but not always. Um, so it'd be nice if we could just 
toss out all that and say, here, memdaflex dupe. We are, we're deserializing this information from, you know, screen and sticking it <clears throat> into the pixel data member of image. And we need to allocate that for count many of them, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, you know, you can leave the multiplication overflow here because it'll get caught <clears throat> by memdaflexdupe. Memdaflexdupe will look at the count and say, whoa, something's weird. Um, I don't like it. Here, we're gonna set a uh, return value. Um, and, and everything will be safe. We won't end up with a mismatch between allocation and copy, et cetera, et cetera. You can still have bugs around it. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm leaving out uh, out-of-bound reads uh, out of the source uh, just for simplicity here, especially since most stuff is about write overflows. Um, and in this example, I'm, I'm showing you like a, a worst case design of the API where you actually have to name the, uh, the pixel data and pixels, the, the array elements, and I'm sorry, the, the flexible array elements member name and the flexible array element count member name. Uh, and I'll show you, I think, a, a way that we can avoid having to repeat that every time. Um, there's also, you can we'll have helpers for, did you already do the allocation? <clears throat> cool, okay. The, we can test, you know, we can test that we're not copying beyond the bounds of the allocation because we can check the um, flexible array count member, you know, pixels. We'll actually look at that before we do our copy, even if, you know, if, if the helper wasn't responsible for doing the allocation itself. Um, so this not only checks for more conditions, uh, it also reduces the amount of code that's actually visible here in each of these instances and makes things, I think, uh, significantly more readable. Um, here's a real world example. More recently is uh, another remote code execution in TIPC. This is another heap overflow of a simple flexible array structure. Um, we've got keylen, which is the uh, flexible array element count member and key, the flexible array itself. And it was just happily copying into key from uh, data coming off the wire. Um, here's a, a drill down and a bit of a simplification of, of what this looked like. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing to call out here is that originally this was U16 size reading message data, which was returning U32. So that has, you know, risks truncation. Um, and then down here we've got you know, keylen is coming in off the wire, but there is no checking that this is gonna be within the allocation size that we just did above, and we happily copy into key off of keylen. So we can use that new API, like I was uh, saying, to just replace basically all of it. Um, we got memdaflex stoop, if we wanna allocate, S key, we're gonna copy from data this much and with these uh, allocation flags. Um, it becomes much shorter. There's one return that we check. Um, still have to fill the, the fixed size copy, um, but there are some proposed alternatives so we could do an entire deserialization at once. Um, so, the early design of this helper needed the callers to include the flexible array and flexible array count member names as args every single time. So here, keylen and key had to be there, you know, in in line two, and this just made it clunky. It was hard to use. It was hard to do conversions. It would be nicer if a compiler, which really ought to be able to figure this out, since you can only have realistically one flexible array. Um, meaningfully in a, in, a, in a structure. Most structures um, only have one flexible array. Things are different when you get into more complex stuff, but more complex stuff can use different helpers. Anyway, so there's the key and key land that we could just get rid of. Um, be nice. So uh, what's being added is this bounded flex array helper, uh, much like the struct group uh, helper from earlier, that uh, you specify your uh, your element count variable and type and the flexible array type and name as well. Um, and now we can drop the names here because the helper is actually gonna create named aliases for the count and the elements um, that is the same in every single one of these that uses bounded flex array. Um, so we can find them always, but the types 
uh, can be whatever they want to be. Um, and this is done, again, surprise, with unions. Um, so we had the flexible array struct. Uh, the, the count member, you just have a union with the same type, and you have whatever name you want it to have, plus this fixed name called underscore underscore flex array elements count. And then for the flexible array itself, it's the same thing. We've got a union of the same type, and one is named whatever you wanted to name it, and the other is called underscore underscore flex array elements. Now the kind of ugly thing here is that making a union of a, a, a flexible array is weirdly not legal currently, but you can work around it by adding a named thing in a structure that isn't a flexible array, but it also doesn't have to have any size. So you just have an empty struct with some unique name. It's really, it's really silly. Uh, so I don't know why that limitation exists because it's clearly not about uh, anything about the size of the structures. So this basically makes a union of two flexible arrays, um, one with a name as specified by the user and one that can be used by the helpers. And in this case, we can also keep things forward compatible to uh, you know, future C language structures where we can actually specify uh, the uh, element count bounds for a flexible array in the language itself. So here we could have the, the count gets declared and then we could say, oh, here's the type of this array of the flexible array and here's the name that we want. And by the way, it's runtime bounded by that prior member name. Um, and we can actually gain that automatically uh, once the C language grows that, uh, which I, I really like the idea of not having to send hundreds of patches to the kernel uh, to get some of this stuff landed. And so here I can give you a look at a really simplified version of uh, the mem to flex dupe helper. Um, these are all horrendous macros, but uh, I'll, I'll step you through what's going on. And I broke coding style a little bit just so I could fit this on the screen. Like you can see my lines with breaks on them, but I'll get into that. Um, so first of all, this is a statement expression. So it's returning RC at the end of it. So whatever value RC has once all this code runs is what will be returned from this macro. Um, but because we wanna make sure we're always checking the return value, we really wanna have uh, the must check attribute added to it, but you can't add uh, function attributes to a macro. So since this returns an int, uh, the, the statement expression returns an int, we can just add a wrapper called must check erno as a function that's a static inline that has the must check attribute uh, that takes RC and returns RC and um, and has the must check attribute. So any callers of mem to flex dupe now actually have to check RC. They can't just leave it un, un, unassigned. Um, one complication though, that this is not a function, it is a macro, is that for me to, uh, sorry, that it's a statement expression, uh, not a function, is that I can't just leave in the middle of it. Uh, I actually have to reach the end of it. Uh, so we can sort of simulate that by adding a do while zero in the middle and we can break out of stuff to jump straight to the end. Um, this is just a fun way to get uh, the shortcutting to the error conditions. So we start with RC equals negative E in val, just as a robustness thing about if there's somehow some code path in the macro, in the larger macro, that um, doesn't ever, uh, I don't know, doesn't ever set RC for some reason, we will leave with an invalid RC uh, and, and things should uh, be discovered quickly. So that's mostly a robustness thing. Um, and then we've got our failure cases. Um, which I'll cover. Um, here we've got local variables. We've got this, this pointer to uh, what we're gonna be allocating, the, the flexible array structure, uh, and then two size T helpers for us doing size calculations. So the first one, the first check, the first sanity check here is, can the count that has been requested actually be represented by the flexible array count member of this structure. So since we're you know, able to use the, uh, the aliases that were generated, we can look at the type of the flexible array elements count member and use another helper that gives you the maximum 
uh, storage value of that. You know, if it's a, if it's a U8, that's going to be 255, etc. So if count is greater than that, uh, we fail because it's going to be truncated, and uh, we don't want to truncate and warn. We want to fail uh, because we are going to end up in an inconsistent state. Um, then we start doing the calculation of the actual size of of, of what we're going to be copying. Uh, this is the the flexible array elements. So the size of a single flexible array element times however many of them that we want count uh, gets stored into copy bytes. And if that fails, if that multiplication overflows uh, for whatever reason, um, then also fail. And then finally, we need the allocation size. So we need the the everything ahead of the flexible array structure. Uh, sorry, the flexible array in the flexible array structure. So that the header, all the rest of it. Uh, so we add the size of that structure uh, because it doesn't count the flexible array itself in the size of. Uh, plus the copy bytes we just calculated and store it in alloc bytes. And if that happens overflow, we also fail. Um, so all of those lead to saying, ah, something's too big here and we're going to break. Um, if all of that passes, we can actually do the allocation. And if the allocation fails, we return with enum uh, Then in this version of this helper, we're going to set the, the, the header, everything prior to the flexible array member in the structure to zero. And uh, then we actually do the mem copy, and this is you know we've we've calculated all the sizes, everything's happy. Let's let's do it. Uh, let's copy that out. Um, and again, I'm skipping uh, read size checking here. This is just for write size uh, write size checking. So we know that this one isn't going to overflow given the allocation and everything else that's gone on. So we do the unfortified mem copy. And then finally, uh, we're going to store. The flexible array elements count for the count that we already validated can actually fit in it. Uh, assign our our allocation, uh, you know, assign the first variable to mem to flex dupe to our allocation. Clear RC to be zero, and exit, and we're done. So we've done all of that uh, in the macro to do everything we need. Um, and that's basically the 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 shortened version of of what we've been up to. Um, this has been a long road. Uh, there's a strong relationship between dash w array bounds uh, with array sizes and flexible arrays and the cleanup needed to get the compiler doing the right thing all across you know 25 million lines of code. Um, so skipping past the like two and a half years of cleaning up all sorts of stuff um, that people have been doing, um, we've got uh, 5.16 released uh, this last January, and that introduced struct group uh, and, and related helpers and um, did the bulk of the remaining flexible array conversions um, that, that were needed um, and the addition and, and, and struct group conversions. Um, 5.17 in late March, um, we were finished with all the struct group conversions um, and had almost all the rest of the array bounds warning fix finally. In 5.18, uh, we were able to finally turn on array bounds warnings at compile time globally and um, add the compile time mem copy enforcement. So, you know, refusing to do a mem copy when the, the size of the destination and the size of the copy were known in advance, uh, which really means all of the cases of intentional, you know, cross member overflows were, were fixed. Um, and then coming up, uh, 5.19, probably in July, um, we added a help, helper called unsafe memcopy, which basically doesn't perform fortify checking even when fortify is, uh, is enabled. And that's mostly to, uh, that's to deal with cases that there is no clean solution for right now. It's a bit of a chicken bit. It's designed to be temporary. Uh, it adds an additional fourth argument that is meant to contain uh, a comment that describes why the mem copy is in fact considered to be safe, um, why it can't be, you know, why it can't be converted to anything else, like a, basically a, an, an enforced comment about uh, why this area of code is believed to be safe, uh, so that we don't, you know, people fixing these in the future don't have to reinvent, like rediscover what was going on. 
And of course, <clears throat> what, what happened right as 5.18 released is that GCC 12 came out um, and it had uh, some more intelligence about its internal diagnostics. So we ended up with 200 more array bounds warnings. Um, unfortunately, it seems like some somewhat large portion of these are actually false positives. Uh, I think we've got three open bugs now against GCC 12 that are related to getting things wrong. Um, so <clears throat> right now we've kind of had to turn off array bounds for GCC 12 uh, because it's 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 kind of overly broken. Um, and then in five um, in five twenty coming maybe in October. Uh, I'm hoping to see the memdaflex dupe and the related helpers landing um, so that we can finally turn on the runtime warning of memcopy uh, overflows. So all that stuff, the, the bleeding tooth and everything else, we can actually start turning that into a, a strict failure, but we got to start with the warnings first and shake out any other intentional runtime uh, overflows before we can turn that on. Um, although people can also set panic on warn if they've tested their their workloads um, so hopefully by 5.20 and that's uh that's everything um have any questions or feedback uh feel free to um send me email uh the slides url is here um thanks for your time and attention um take care <laughs>